Hey, this is Bass 2 Yang, and let's get started with vocal subharmonics. So what I have here is a test oscillator in Logic Pro X set at 220 hertz, which is A3 on our keyboard, as you can see here. Let's get some sound going. There we go. So A3 at 220. And this test oscillator, oh, what it's going to do is it's going to activate my speakers here uh, in momentarily. So I'll turn this down for you just a little bit so it's not too overbearing. Let's go to negative 20. And here's what we got. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to use a tuning fork in addition to this test oscillator. And that speaker right there that we have is actually generating, is responding to the pitch that's generated from Logic X. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to ring anything. I'm just going to go ahead and slightly set the tuning fork on of the woofer right there. And you should hear a response from my phone. So essentially what this does is the tuning fork interacts at certain intervals against the frequency that's being generated, whether it's A3 or A2. And that interaction, so there's no actual pitch generated, but that interaction distorts the A2 uh, in this case and mimics the same wave length or the same wave pattern as an A1. You notice that sounds a little rough, uh, almost as if it's distorted, because that's essentially what's happening is that the wave is interacting with each other, and it's slightly offset to where it actually mimics the same wave pattern as an A1. So this A2 mimics the same pattern as the A, as the A1. So vocal subharmonics, as it applies to the voice, has the same properties as any other naturally occurring subharmonics. You'll notice the interaction with the speaker and the tuning fork. The same thing applies to our voice. And how I look at it is I look at it as a range between full voice and vocal fry. For me, let, let's say, let's choose, a, let's choose a comfortable note for both male and female voices. So that's an F3. If I sing the F3 in full voice, so let's say this side or here, full voice. Oh, and I apply the vocal fry as a layer. So I'm not mixing the two. I'm just simply 
allowing the fry to sneak in to interact with my voice, I will automatically get the octave below. So here it is again. Oh. So obviously that sound, I'm not too fond of it because it's pretty high in my register. Let's choose a note that's a little, little bit lower. So let's go for A flat two. notice in my voice the breath energy doesn't change the vowel doesn't change it's almost as if I'm just slightly allowing the vocal fry to touch the full voices the full voices note so it's not being mixed together it's not really it, all it's doing is it's just interacting together and that's the simplest way I, way I can put it um, As I sing through uh, rep, um, I've noticed that it's very effective for choir repertoire. Um, solo repertoire depends on what you do. Art songs are fine if it requires you to go that low. Um, songs that are mic'd, like uh, pop songs, jazz, uh, contemporary, that works really well. Um, opera, I've not used it in an opera setting. I've used it for auditions. And so far, they've, they've worked really well for auditions. But in terms of like an actual full production where you're on stage for hours and hours of time. I haven't gone through that entire process to know whether or not it's effective. So if you are on stage and you've used subharmonics before, let me know. It'd be nice to, to hear. Um, I've used it in choral performances plenty of times. You've seen my videos and they're very effective. There are times to where they don't, the subharmonics just doesn't work. And I just count that as a loss and move on. So I don't think too much of it. Uh, for me, for vocal subharmonics, the number one key is confidence. Um, as you work through this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of making the mistakes. And in terms of health-wise, a couple of you have asked the question, is this healthy? Is this safe? Um, I will say that there is a fail-safe me mechanism in there that happens when you try to press or you try, try to force the subharmonic and that your voice automatically pops up the octave. So I'll demonstrate for you and I'll over, -exag over exaggerate it as well. Let's go for uh, A flat again. Oh. And it sounds, obviously, it sounds ridiculous. So you want to try to avoid forcing it, but don't be so cautious that you lose uh, track of where it belong, where it occurs in your voice. Because there will be times where you, your voice will pop up the octave while you're performing. And to be honest, besides the people next to me, and even then, like no one really notices. And so just do your best. Um, you can take it down. There are those of you that can sing it lower, like even down to F. Oh. And, you know, the F is not working too well today. It works really well some days. Some days even D works fine. But for me, A flat is usually the money note. G works really well. F sharp's okay. F is fine now. <laughs> and E works. And it depends on the vowel, it depends on the placement, just like how you would be uh, mindful of where your vocal breaks are or your transition points, um, your passaggio in this case. Um, so just be aware of it. The same thing occurs for subharmonic, there's nothing different. Unless you are forcing something that's different, then it should react the same way. There's a lot of resources out there, so check uh, those other resources out and let me know if you have any questions or comments down below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.